Somebody gonna cut you down. Well, you can throw a rock. Sweet Honey in the Rock, singing God's Gonna Cut You Down. They were singing last night at Riverside Church, remembering the great folk singer, blues singer Odetta. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A panel of experts set up by the International Commission of Jurists has concluded that counterterrorism measures adopted after 9-11, quote, threaten the very core of the international human rights framework. The panel's report, called Assessing Damage, Urging Action, was released last week following a three-year study of how tactics used in the so-called War on Terror have eroded rights and liberties the world over and created a climate of, quote, lingering cynicism. The panel includes 60 senior jurists from around the world. The report studies counterterrorism practices in 40 countries, but concentrates on the United States, asking President Obama to, quote, immediately and publicly renounce the characterization of counterterrorism as a war and to investigate human rights abuses against terrorists and suspects. The report was headed up by Mary Robinson, the president of the International Commission of Jurists. She's joining us now in our firehouse studio. She was president of Ireland between 1990 and 97, then was appointed the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, a post she held till 2002. Previously, she was a senator in Ireland for 20 years. She's been the honorary president of Oxfam International since 2002 and founded an NGO called Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. In 2004, she received Amnesty International's Ambassador of Conscience Award and in 2005 was awarded the first outspoken award from the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Rights Commission for her role in helping to decriminalize homosexuality in Ireland. We welcome you to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, talk about this report you've just released and specifically what you're saying to the United States and President Obama. There's been a lot written on the war on terror and counterterrorism, but this was the first time that there were hearings in 16 countries that involved more than 40, because some of them were regional hearings. And yes, we did look very closely, both at the United States and United Kingdom law. We had hearings in both London and Belfast, uh, because we found that in countries that didn't have good protections, they felt the laws had changed, so they expanded their bad laws and clamped down on freedom of the press, on political activism. And when we challenged that, they would say, oh, but look at the United States. They, they, they no longer say no torture. Look what they're doing with Guantanamo. Look at Abu Ghraib, etc. So we had to hold those who you know, speak about democracy and freedom to the standard that they need to be held to. And we were, we were shocked at how uh, the standards had dipped. And of course, it wasn't making us more secure. President Obama hasn't said this very much, but he did say he wants to stop using those words, war on terror. Have you spoken to him? We haven't spoken to him. In fact, I go today to Washington, and we will be meeting with some officials. We'll be meeting. Uh, there's a, a, an event tomorrow with the Brookings Institution in uh, Washington. Uh, I hope we will have an opportunity, and I hope in particular that he and members of administ his administration read our report. It's not. Uh, it, it's a report that's intended to be helpful and constructive, but we really do want to bring home the damage that has been done. Some of it through a great expansion of intelligence gathering in secret with no accountability and no oversight. And some of that intelligence has been obtained by torture. I was very pleased last night in his speech that President Obama was so unequivocal as he has been from the beginning about no torture and got a standing ovation. That's a step in the right direction. Extraordinary rendition, however, uh, the kidnapping of people in one country, sending them to another, or right here in the United States, like Maharar, the Canadian citizen who was taken from JFK and sent off to Syria. And we um, wouldn't have known about that case properly if it hadn't been for an independent inquiry in Canada. They admitted they got tainted uh, false information. They have apologized and they've compensated. The United States still has not apologized and has not admitted wrong in that regard. When we were in London launching the report, the newspapers were full of this case of the Ethiopian British resident who's just been returned from Guantanamo. He claims to have been tortured in Morocco with UK intelligence officers handing in the questions to him. Uh, we don't know because we haven't had an inquiry yet how much validity, but the United States will not hand over intelligence that was gathered from him. Um, and that is a matter that has been before the British courts. So we have this secret world of unaccountability. And we say this is one of the problems when you talk about a war and you use that paradigm. And uh, when you don't uphold the standards of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. When I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, you know, the United States at the beginning in particular was a strong ally 
of these standards. During the last year, which was the year after 9-11, I found that I had to critique the United States because it was not upholding those standards and how, how damaging that has been. We know it's part of the damage to the reputation of the United States. You were forced out as chair of the Human Rights Commission in 2002. Well, I um, had gone for an extra year after my first term of four years, and I did indicate that I'd be prepared to serve for the further three years, the full four-year second term. And it was clear that the United States did not want me to because I was an open critic. But uh, it's important that uh, this is uh, you know, seen more as where do we go from here? Uh, the United States has an administration now which has recognized the damage. And I think we should be looking forward and saying there are steps that need to be taken. And we need to understand that acts of terrorism are very serious criminal acts. And in our report, we repeat frequently that we know that these are real threats. And governments have a, a, a duty to protect as, as the first responsibility of government. And we're not soft at all on terrorism. We want more effective measures to bring terrorists to justice and put them away for a long time. But if you bend the rules, other countries will not respect you and they will bend them further. I wanted to ask you about the crisis in the Middle East, about Israel and Palestine. Uh, let me start by asking uh, you uh, about George Mitchell, who is the envoy, um, special envoy for Northern Ireland under the Clinton administration, now named the special envoy for the Middle East, currently second trip to the region. The former Maine senator addressed reporters last month during his first trip to the Middle East. The United States is committed to vigorously pursuing uh, lasting peace and stability in the region. The decision by President Obama to dispatch me to come to this region less than one week after his inauguration uh, is a clear and tangible evidence of this commitment. I want to ask you about um, the Middle East envoy, George Mitchell. You were the president of Ireland. Uh, your thoughts on him as Middle East envoy? I was very pleased at the appointment. I think there's nobody who will bring more wisdom and understanding and a capacity to listen, which is really very important. When he was making progress in Northern Ireland, I asked a former loyalist Protestant paramilitary who had become a community leader and was helping with reconciliation. I said, how do you, uh, to what do you attribute his success in Northern Ireland? And he used a phrase that I then honored George with later. He said, he listened us out. In other words, he was so patient in listening to the different sides that they ran out of complaints. And then he said, well, now, where do we go from here? Um, there is a need in the context of the Middle East to have an understanding of the narrative, which is completely different on both sides. On the Palestinian side, they are the victims, etc. On the Israeli side, they feel they're the victims in, in some measure. And uh, there needs to be uh, an ability to transcend that and set the course for addressing the, the deep issues that divide. I was in uh, Israel, the West Bank and Gaza in early November, just before Gaza was completely closed off. We were looking at the role of women and strengthening their ability to be part of the voice. And I met some extraordinary Palestinian and Israeli women. And I hope that they will be able to link with George Mitchell in what he's doing. You were quoted uh, by the BBC last year saying, talking about Gaza, their whole civilization has been destroyed. I am not exaggerating. Uh, it's almost unbelievable that the world doesn't care while this is happening. I really believe that. I, I was in Gaza as High Commissioner for Human Rights eight years before. Going back, first of all, the, 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 the way in which the West Bank itself has been divided up uh, by the new settlements, which are you know, very provocative and in many cases illegal, by wall, roads that the Palestinians can't go on, but they have to find ways around, and by the wall. But when I went to Gaza, to be with people who are under siege for 18 months, where there was a truce which at that stage was due for possible renewal, but there had been no dividend. When we were in Northern Ireland and the IRA started to uh, come into some kind of process, we encouraged them by having some kind of a dividend, some kind of a change in circumstances. There was none in Gaza. I met poor farming women whose land had been bulldozed so they couldn't farm. And they said, we learned embroidery, but we've no thread. We learned to make candles, but we've no wax. Uh, there was no activity. 
There was not enough food for families, not enough health care. Uh, we heard terrible stories about pregnant women dying at the border. And I saw, because I, I, I spent two hours going in and going out, I saw very sick people being treated like dirt. Uh, you, you know, you don't treat people like that. It's very dehumanizing. These young conscripts on the Israeli side do not treat the people going in and out as human beings. They treat them.